Fellow auto detailers, welcome to the show that features interviews with today's most successful auto detailers. This is the Auto Detailing Podcast. Here's your host, Jimbo Balaam. Hey, what's up, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Auto Detailing Podcast. Before we get into today's episode, I want to tell you a little bit about the detailerinnercircle.com. If you are really looking at 2020, like you want to take your business to the next level, you need some marketing, some scripts, some help to market your business and get some serious clients and make 2020 your best year ever, I highly suggest checking out thedetailerinnercircle.com. It's something I'm a part of. I partner up with a brilliant marketing mind, um, and we do this thing called the Detailer Inner Circle. So you can find out more information at thedetailerinnercircle.com, and I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 417 of the Auto Detailing Podcast. I'm Jimbo, your host. Today, we have Joe um, Bessia. Oh, did I get that right? Bedessa. Bedessa. Dang it. I think, whatever. I knew I was going to mess it up. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, welcome to the club where everyone messes up your last name. That's the club I'm in. Joe, welcome to the Auto Detailing Podcast. Sorry for butchering your last name there. That's okay. Thanks for having me on. You got it. And Joe is in Largo, Florida, which I just learned is West Central Florida? Yes. Got it. And Joe's been in the game for about 23 years and mainly has found, or has carved out a niche for himself in the classics. So everything from uh, you know repairing uh, OEM paint that's original to engines and all that, and I can't wait to get into all that. But Joe, it probably didn't start there. So why don't you take us back to the beginning and kind of tell us how you got into detailing and, frankly, why detailing? Um, well, I grew up around cars. Uh, my grandfather had a small used car lot. My dad, my uncle had a body shop. My, uh, my cousin was a painter, and I was just always in that environment. Um, the time came for me to get a job. Uh, I didn't want to work with my family. And uh, a friend of mine was working at um, the local car wash. Um, he got me a job there, and I started washing cars. And then how did it, pro- did, how did it progress from a car wash? Because it seems like from a car wash to uh, working on classics and kind of restoring classics, that's a big jump. Yeah, well, the, the car wash that I worked at, um, it was called Magic Car. And, uh, it was a detail shop, but they, they had a lot of, uh, car washing going on, a lot of volume. Um, and I would say it was probably the way that place was set up was, it was like a boutique detail shop before that was kind of a thing. Um, it was, it was kind of a special place to be honest. Um, so they were really heavy on the fundamentals of how to wash a car um, you know, proper techniques, things like that. And, uh, you know, as you proved yourself and wanted to learn more, eventually you became a detailer and, uh, that's what I did. And, uh, you know, I started detailing cars and I just loved it. I remember my first day, um, it was a Saturday. They were slammed. I think I worked like 10 hours straight, no lunch. But the way I felt when I was on my way home at the end of the day, I was like, man, this is a great feeling. Like just kind of reflecting on the day. It it was, it was really good. Um, And I think that's kind of where the bug bit me. Isn't that Um, so awesome when you figure out something that like maybe you didn't know, or you just, like you said, you get done with a long day or a super busy day and you're almost like, have more energy after you finish than when you started. And it's like, whoa, oh, yeah. that's, that's like, it's like awesome once you realize that, you know? Yeah. Um, I worked there for, I don't know, a few years. Um, they also had a, a dealership account at uh, a Mercedes dealer. Um, eventually I went there, was detailing there. Um, Then I was like the night manager at one point. Um, That business had gotten sold. um, And I worked for the the new owner and then it kind of fell apart. Um, Then I 
uh, one of the, my friends that was also working there, he was another detailer. Um, he was working at another shop. Um, so he got me a job there. And then that was like, that's when everything kind of got real. Um, I'm not going to name that shop, but, uh, magic car was kind of like high school to me. And then this other place was like college. Got it. Um, they had eight detailers working there. They had a body shop. Um, they had multiple dealer accounts, but we weren't doing like line work by any means. It was like heavy stuff. Um, you know, they'd give us a car, we'd go around it, inspect it, look for paint work, you know, paint work got sanded, um, you know, blend work into the factory paint to match the peel, you know, we're sanding out jam edges, we're pulling apart interiors. So really extensive stuff. Um, and I worked there for probably five or six years or something. And, uh, on top of the dealer accounts they had, they had multiple guys bringing in classic cars, you know, guys that flipped them. And uh, I ended up doing that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> as time went on, I was doing all the classics there. And, uh, you know, there was more and more classics coming in, but the bread and butter of the shop was the dealer stuff. So they would always kind of get pushed to the side. Um, eventually, uh, I built a relationship with those customers and, you know, they were like, Hey, you know, why don't you come to our place and do some of our stuff that we can't get in here. We want you to do our cars anyways. So I was like, okay, I saw it as an opportunity. And uh, I was working at that shop during the day um, and then going to the other customers' shops at night, working till like 9, 10 o'clock. And I did that for a while. And it was just kind of burning the candle at both ends. And I found myself in a crossroads where I was like, okay, I got to make a decision. Do I want to go out on my own and do all these classics or stay where I'm at? And, you know, I had to choose progression. So that's what I did. I started working out of the trunk of my car and so I could eventually afford a shop and uh, things just kind of took off from there. And how long, how long ago was that? Was that the 23? Um, have you been on your own for 23 years? No, no. Okay. 23 years was like when I first started Got it. Okay. at that car wash. Got um, it. I've been in business for myself since 2007. Awesome. So. Okay. Wow. Interesting. So I started in 2008 and it's it, I, maybe it was different for, me, for you in Florida, but everyone was telling me because of the financial crash and the recession that it was such a horrible time to start a business. And after hearing that story, I can only imagine like, you know, the the pushback or maybe not even pushback from people but kind of like like the mental dialogue going on in your own head of like do I go out on my own right now or do I just stay at this shop like was that a tough decision because of the market at the time or was it more so just deciding if you wanted to do it on your own or not well it was right before things got bad with the economy so it really wasn't got a factor it. okay but like one year in you know, a lot of my customers went under and I pretty much lost like 50% of my clients. Okay. And, uh, I kind of had to adjust, start taking in more retail customers, you know, other dealer accounts, things like that. Got it. And, uh, eventually as things got better with the economy, um, I, I got back to where I originally wanted to be. So things have been going pretty strong for the awesome. past, I'd say, now, since probably 2009, 10, things really started to improve. Got it. And so how long did that take from kind of working out of the trunk of your car to getting a shop? How, how long was that kind of? Um, it was relatively quick. It was maybe like three months. Okay. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. So bring us up to speed to today. What is a what is your business look like today compared to what 
it was when you first moved into a shop? Um, the workload has definitely gotten heavier. Um, as time has gone on, the demands of my customers have increased and that's, that's kind of how I've gotten to where I'm at with how I do things. Um, so talk about that. Tell us how, how do you do things or what, what kind of makes you different? Well, for instance, uh, a customer will bring me a car, we'll go around it. Um, and again, like I said, a lot of my customers, they flip classic cars. So they're going to the big auctions, Barrett Jackson, Meekum, things like that. Um, so the car has got to be perfect inside out and upside down. So, you know, the paint, whatever it needs, you know, wet sanding is always a must on these old cars. They're all repaints or they're partial repaints. Um, the undercarriages, you know, they're, some of them are 30, 40 years of grease, dirt, you know, all that's going to be taken care of. So I had to get a lift. Um, the engine apartments, you know, it's not like detailing a, 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 an engine on a regular car. You open the hood, everything's plastic. It's relatively simple where on these cars, it's, it's like a whole new job under there. You know, everything is painted a different color. You know, they're almost like its own little work of art. Um, you've got multiple things to deal with. You know, you've got to paint things, you've got metals to polish, um, you know, certain shades of black, you know, maybe this component is a satin finish where another component is supposed to be uh, a gloss finish. And, you know, it, you can get really in depth. Um, sometimes you'll spend two, three days just in an engine compartment. Uh, and the situations that I've been put in because of the demands of my customers, I've gained a lot of experience like that. Uh, it's always pushed me. Um, so you've got to learn, you've got to do research online. Okay. What, what did this look like when it was new in 1967? Because that's what I have to make it look like. Um, over time, some of these cars, you know, they get messed with, you know, they get the wrong hoses put on them. Some of them get modified, you know, they've got the wrong valve covers. So, you know, usually I'll have my customer source out, you know, the correct things that need to be replaced. They get sent to me. I'll, I'll change all that stuff. Uh, and we just make them look as original as possible. Um, same thing with the undercarriages, you know, uh, once you get everything cleaned, it's like, okay, what needs to be done? Okay. The frame needs to be painted. The, uh, the shocks are the wrong color. Those need to be addressed. Um, you know, the, the bottom of the engine needs to be repainted. The springs, you know, it, it just goes on and on and on. And sometimes it's like, okay, well, where do you stop? The rabbit hole gets pretty deep on some of these jobs. So how, that's a, that's a great point. How do you know when to stop? Like what, at what point does it cross? Because it seems like you're, you're in pretty deep communication with your client the whole time about their car, right? From the, the time yeah. they acquire it to the time it leaves your shop and to go for sale wherever. So where is that? kind of done in the initial assessment of the car of like where the client wants to take it or like where, where do you stop? <laughs> Sometimes you drive yourself crazy trying to figure out where to stop. Um, it depends sometimes on the budget of the customer, you know, because it's also about their profit margins at the end of the day. Um, sometimes it's a special car and they're like, just do everything. Um, it's a communication thing. Um, again, it's like, well, you know, everything looks good, but the gas tank is kind of old and cruddy looking. Sometimes they'll replace things like that as well. Um, I don't, I'm not a mechanic, so I won't, I won't do that kind of stuff, but 
again, it's, it's based on the budget, you know, the value of the car, um, that kind of stuff. Got it. So, and that would be kind of assessed pre detail yeah. or, and, and probably I would assume as you go along in some situations, right? Yeah. Pre pre inspection, you know, go over it with the customer and then also on the fly, you know, you'll, you'll find something like, Hey, you know, do you want to do this? Do you want to go that far? And you know, they either say yes or no. And you just kind of move forward from that point. What um, is the average amount of time that you're spending on any particular car? Um, usually, usually a week, two weeks, sometimes, um, it depends, um, on the condition of the vehicle, obviously. Um, some of these cars, uh, they're older restorations, so everything needs to be addressed, but it's not like, you know, uh, the undercarriage has never been touched ever, you know, it, through its lifespan. Um, those cars obviously take less time. Um, you know, you're just kind of going through and refreshing an old restoration where you get a car where it might have been repainted, uh, the interior, some of it's been replaced, but underneath the car's never been touched and it just, you know, it looks terrible. <laughs> um, those are the, the ones that really take a lot of time. You know, you'll sit there for a day just scraping old grease and undercoating off before you can even really see what's there. You know, it's, right. uh, it can get crazy. Jeez. And you're, current, you're, you're doing all this by yourself, right? I would imagine that trust yeah. between uh, your customers and their cars and all that is, is paramount. So. I would imagine that beyond uh, just h how difficult hiring in general is, there's kind of a, a level of trust that needs to be there as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's hard to find people with, you know, a niche experience, you know. Mm. Um, a lot of the experience that I've gained has been from – you know, the cars that have been put in front of me, sure, you know, it's right. like you, you're, you're constantly learning on the fly, you know, uh, especially with the paints too. Like, you know, you get a new car, you can go online, talk to other detailers like, Hey, you know, how's this paint react? What's, what's the best polishing method for this paint pads, compounds, mm. what have you, where, you're getting a car that you don't know what kind of paints on it, how long ago it was painted, you know, they're all different. So if there's no reference there. It's like, okay, it's touch and go, you know? Right. Um, and that, that alone will give you a lot of experience. Um, and I'd say 95% of these cars are, they're all full wet sand jobs. You know, they're, they've got orange peel, there's dirt in the paint, there's, you know, all mm. kinds of stuff going on, lots of scratches. So just a regular correction is like, you, you can't even go that route. You know, you, you kind of have to create your own surface. Right. Um, and then move forward from that point. Hmm. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, crazy. Is there, man, that's insane. Do you have a favorite classic to work on? Um, huh, yeah, the stuff that I grew up with, mm. like the posters on my wall as a kid. Um, people ask me this all the time. Oh, what's your favorite old car? And Sometimes the answer I give them is a little weird. I'm like, okay, maybe like an 84 Corvette because my dad had one when I was growing up, mm, you know, right. it doesn't make sense to them. But the things that are nostalgic to me okay. are the things that I enjoy working on. Um, I do work on a lot of Corvettes. I'd say if I had to choose any old muscle car, it'd probably be a 67 Corvette okay. for sure. Got it. And how do you, is, is the word of mouth kind of your main way of getting more customers or, or do you have like a, 
uh, a group of customers that are constantly flipping cars, so you really don't need more customers? Like, what does that look like? Um, well, uh, most of my customers I've had from the beginning, um, and I've built a good relationship with those people. They're like friends to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, word of mouth mainly. Um, you know, they tell people, and then those people tell people. Um, so I've been lucky in that aspect. I haven't had to do much advertising or anything like that. Got it. Um, once word gets out there, especially if they have a special need for a ve- for the work that needs to be done to a vehicle, mm-hmm. you know, there's nobody else to do it. So, you know, but I still I still get new customers all the time, um, and I've been pretty lucky to where I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, codings, since I started to get into codings, that's, that's kind of opened up things for me a little bit more. So I'm more open to doing things for the general public, you know, your average daily driver stuff, that kind of thing. Um, so I've been more welcoming to that, you know, retail based, um, because the majority of my customers buy and sell. So, you know, so you are kind of, codings have kind of opened up a, a whole different market for you then, or the current because the current customers probably aren't putting codings on, right? No, they are. Um, once I started to get into codings, I was able to sell it to you know my my prior customers. Um, you know, here's this new thing we can do to your car once we've done all this work. Um, they see it as an investment, just like your regular guy driving his car who loves it and wants to protect it. Um, you know, the cars look better. Uh, they can use that as a sales tool at the sale. Um, you know, and if if they don't sell the car, it doesn't need to come back and get refreshed up. Because, Got it. You know, the coating's protecting it at the that auction. You know, it's getting wiped down a million times by dirty towels. Right. You know, so got it. You know, they see they see the uh, the advantages of that as well. So got it. What do you see kind of next for either the detailing industry or or your role kind of in your area in the next couple two to five years? Do you think coatings are going to become an even bigger part of your business, um, or where do you kind of see it going? Um, I think coatings are definitely going to be a bigger part of my business. I mean, it's it'd be stupid not to want to go in that direction. Uh, it's very profitable. Um, I think, uh, the technology is just getting better, faster and faster. Um, which is great. Uh, detailing's hot right now. You know, there's, there's a lot of detailers in this area. A lot of them are good. So, uh, I just see it continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, another thing is, as long as I've been detailing, I've seen that we're finally starting to get what we're worth, Mm. if that makes any sense. Totally. Um, Because I I remember the old days, you know, the $100 full detail, you know, and you know, as well as I do, you spend all this time on a car and you know, you feel like you're not getting what your time's worth, but I think finally we're, we're getting our due, you know? Um, and and that's great for the industry. Yep. Um, cause we work hard, you know, for sure. For sure. What, what advice, say there's someone out there and they're interested in, or they kind of want to nail down this niche of working on classics and stuff like that. What, what advice would you give them to get how, how yeah what advice would you give them to get into the industry of classics um that's kind of a tough question um it just kind of fell in into my lap the way i got into it you know the the classics kind of just started to gravitate toward me um i would say you know go to uh Go to car shows, talk to people, um, 
build relationships. <clears throat> That's always important is to build relationships with customers, long, long-term relationships. Um, you know, go to, go to classic car auctions, talk to people, um, you know, it, it's kind of hard to say where to meet these people, to be honest. Um, like I said, I was fortunate to get into it the way I did. Um, so yeah, got it. Okay. Right on, man. That's, it's been awesome. If anyone wants to kind of connect with you, maybe pick your brain a little bit more, how could they get a hold of you? How could they follow you on social? How can they get a hold of you? Um, you can, uh, you can email me, uh, colorworks project at gmail.com. Um, colorworks on Facebook. Um, Joe Badessa on Facebook. Um, I have two Facebook accounts, uh, one I don't use anymore. So if you want to uh, contact me through my personal Facebook, it's the one with all the cars. So, <laughs> <laughs> Got it. And is there anything yeah. else that uh, we didn't cover that you'd like to cover, make sure it comes across? Um, no, I think we touched everything. Yeah. Awesome, man.